this is to as i said earlier give you a bit of a story on a product we now call gynecam the story is not complete it's still going on but what i hope to explain in this process is what's likely to happen in terms of a struggle to figure out what to work on and how to build an appropriate solution so there are multiple challenges to this and there are multiple challenges to us as academics trying to innovate and so there's elements of technology which I'll discuss there's aspects of funding there's aspects of how to do this this kind of research inside a you know, engineering college kind of setting and to the extent that I can identify some best practices these might be things that you can then do in your own colleges to set up your own innovation processes so that's the way I do it so I'll start with gynecam which is about cervical cancer but I'll end by generalizing to what I think you guys can do and it's just to let you know that things can get done in a certain way so if you remember the background to us getting into healthcare was something like six years ago, no, six, more than six, it's already 2019, so eight years ago. IIT Bombay said that um, healthcare should be a thrust area, we should be doing research in healthcare. How do you do research in healthcare? You got to figure out what are the challenges that the clinical community has. What do the doctors need as solutions? What do the patients need as solutions? What is the need? And that was, if you remember, that I started by going and talking to 100 doctors and 100 challenges came my way and which ones do we work on? In hindsight, if I go and look at that spreadsheet of challenges, most of them are absolutely wrong statements. Right? What's interesting is that these are not statements which are wrong because people deliberately told us wrong stuff. Whoever told us a challenge statement genuinely thought that that thing deserved to be solved, but they did not ask questions about impact, they did not ask questions about translation. And it turns out many of those solutions, if they were built, would have you know, made a difference to only 5 doctors, 10 doctors. And, if was, and then you have to ask the question, should I be spending my time on creating a solution which benefits only 5 doctors? Of course, the 5 doctors will impact many patients. But it impacts only five doctors. Whereas if I build something which impacts thousand doctors, better. So that's how it started with this. Okay. These are staggering numbers. It's the second leading cancer in women. Cancer, of course, women die of other things. We see numbers reported of order of magnitude 1 lakh deaths. Cancer, by the way, is a slow disease. It takes years for you, human. Your quality of life when you have cancer, you know this, is very poor because you are taking nasty drugs, just trying to survive. Right? This is talking about deaths, it is not talking about people with cancer who will have a lousy quality of life. Okay? Greater than 27% of global cases are in India. And one of the issues here is that there is nobody in India who has a reason to come up with the real statistics of cancer. The government doesn't want to spend time trying to figure out what is the actual incidence of cancer because they look bad. No, think, think of it. Since independence, a lot of money has been spent on healthcare. If you look up the government statistics, the incidence of cancer is dropping. And the reality is not the case that it's dropping. In fact, it's going the other way around. Why? Because because the testing is getting to be more efficient, and more cases are being detected, and more people are coming to hospitals. So, so the real numbers, from the perspective of doctors and hospitals and the flood of patients, you go to Parel where Tata Memorial is. There are people who are living on the footpath, waiting for a turn to get, waiting for their turn inside the hospital to get a consultation. Doctors hate coming in on Monday morning. Monday morning, 
So many patients have come in and are staying on the footpath on the weekend. There is one flood of patients. You will see double the patient load, regular weekday patient load on a Monday morning. Okay. So the numbers are all approximate and the reality is it is much higher. Why? Because large fractions of a population have not been screened at all. Screening is not happening in urban settings. We do not even know what the incidence of cervical cancer is in Mumbai. Forget Assam. Okay. One of the issues with the, um, this is a sad story as well. If you go up to a government officer and you challenge them about the statistics of what is happening in their district, you are putting that officer under pressure. Because why is he not? So, so, and this happened. For example, in Raigad district, an NGO went in there and surveyed malnutrition. And the actual levels of malnutrition are much higher than what the government officers have been reporting. Now, what will happen? The moment you do this study, what will happen? What do you think happened? At this point, the government officer refuses to work with you on anything else. Because you made him look bad. So, ironically what happened is even though you found out the truth, your ability to deploy your solution went away because the government, local government is not going to support you with whatever campaign you come up with for malnutrition, right. So, there is a vicious cycle here where if you report bad numbers, you lose all local support and everyone is under pressure to show the system improving over time. So, you start faking numbers. In the net result, nobody knows the truth of what is going on with most diseases. <coughs> Few years ago, when the mosquito population in the country was ex uh, in Mumbai was exploding, we had a number of dengue cases. And each hospital was asked to identify the number of cases in its immediate vicinity because then you could do some mosquito control program, you could start fumigation, this, that. So each hospital was asked to immediately report to the municipality, the number of cases of dengue that were going on. Our small IIT hospital here reported back that some five students in the hostels had dengue. Uh, we have dengue. One of the reasons you have dengue is because you have lots of air conditioners and the water draining from the air conditioners accumulates, it is stagnant or it is moving slowly and those particular mosquitoes which carry the dengue virus breed in that kind of semi stagnant water. So, we do have it because we have got so many buildings on campus and that kind of AC usage. Of course, when the municipality got the reports, it turns out no other hospital in our area reported dengue. So, from the municipality's perspective, the hotspot for dengue is IIT Bombay because we honestly reported data, nobody else did. <coughs> okay. Now, <clears throat> so the numbers are surely much worse than they are, but the reality about this disease is something else. It is a disease caused by a virus, it is a human papilloma virus, it is a viral infection which causes this. The way it works is, you are familiar that viruses invade cells, insert their DNA into the human DNA, make more copies of themselves and in the process kill the human cell. Of course, the additional copies of the virus will come out they will infect the adjacent cells and the infection keeps growing. When many cells die, finally you will see this as a big lesion and a big wound, but that is at that point it is visible to the naked eye and that infection has really escalated and it has been a while, it has been multiple years when you start seeing large lesions. It is a viral infection. The reason cancer happens here is because when the viral DNA comes in and inserts itself into your DNA, usually your cell would die because some critical function that was being carried out by your DNA is lost to you as the virus came in and inserted itself, usually. But once in a while, when the virus comes in and inserts itself into your DNA, it is as if you lose the breaks in the growth of a cell and now this cell with a viral copy in it starts growing faster and it grows faster and it grows faster. And of course, what happens now? That is the tumor finally 
we talk about where there is a much faster growth rate of these cells because the DNA has been essentially altered by the viral DNA coming into it. Right? So, cancer ultimately reflects uncontrolled growth of cells. It is a disease where there is a break, there is an accelerator and the break fails. There can also be ways to press the accelerator and cause fa faster growth rates of cells. That is also a mechanism. One, one thing a typical tumor will do is actually you will have a very large number of blood vessels around the tumor. Why? Because finally, you have to supply a lot of blood and nutrients if the tumor is to grow faster and faster. And one of the tricks that therefore, cancer has is to accelerate the formation of blood vessels because that feeds itself. Okay. But the root causes a viral infection. At some point in time, a virus damages one particular cell which loses its break and then that particular cell starts growing faster and faster. Many years later, that has become a full blown tumor. You would not detect it at a single cell level because you cannot, it is very hard for you to detect things at a single cell level to find that there is a mutant cell which is growing faster. So, the ho hope, only hope for diagnosis is you wait for a while and then now it shows up in some form. Either there is damage to the tissue which shows as something like a sore or there is a lesion outright, there is a cut there and there is bleeding on this and that. Now, the reason I make a fuss about it being a viral infection is viral infections can be cured. You can take antiviral drugs. So, in theory, if you were to diagnose cervical cancer early, in other words, more precisely, if you were, if you were to diagnose an HPV infection early, you can be given antiviral drugs which will prevent the disease from growing further and further. In fact, even worse, there is a vaccine for it. There is a vaccine which prevents that initial viral infection in the first place because you are immunized when you take the vaccine against that virus and that infection therefore will not happen. The initial damage will not happen. Therefore, the escalation into a tumor will not happen. So, that level of biology we understand. Okay? This is a fully curable disease therefore, if it is detected early which is why it is such a shame that so many people die. The reason we do not make a fuss about it is why? Where, where do these people die? Rural areas. Rural areas. And these are women. You think of the pecking order in a house. If a limited amount of money is to be spent on healthcare in a village, in a house, on whom would you spend it? The male? The female, the child, who do you spend it on? Who is the last person you will spend money on? So, of all possible disease conditions, you can see that this has the least chance of being addressed because of as more of a social aspect of the way the household is structured. The kind of spending you can engage in. So, would you know think of forget villages, how many of us would randomly walk into a hospital and say screen me for cancer? We do not want bad news, we are not going to step up for this. So, we are only going to encounter this when it has become a problem correct for most of us. So, there is no business model there where you can offer checks. Well, it is starting to happen. Some corporate firms are offering such physical, physicals they call them, just checks, blood tests and so on to check whether you might have a problem. Insurance companies would love to know whether you are on the road to cancer because later on the other ones will pay out. But the rules say that insurance companies cannot deny you insurance if you are for example less than 40 years old. They cannot be testing you for these things even. You cannot be denied insurance. So, there is a policy problem. Right. Why is that rule there? Because then you will start tuning the premiums. You will charge some people way much more, other people next to nothing and they, they want that discrimination. Everyone should have equal access to insurance. Do not test them. Because if you test them, you will start fine tuning and personalizing insurance which is not permitted as of now. Anyway, the number of the percentage of people who indulge in insurance, who have insurances is in the country, what do you think? Life insurance, health insurance less than 10 percent, less than 20 percent, less than 30 percent, what is it? 
less than 10 percent that was easy right multiple choice questions always easy okay look at this when the disease happens and now think of that woman let's say in Gachiroli who now comes to Parel sleeps on that footpath how does she get to Parel not alone somebody must come with her who is that somebody a relative so you will find relatives assisting people on the footpath here that relative must be a capable enough person to drag them from that village bring them here look after them here on the footpath arrange for food arrange for some money deal with NGOs do all of that drag them through the hospital get the documentation done get the diagnostic tests done so somebody who is a reasonably capable person if they were not here as an attendant what they, what would they be doing they would be working they would be earning for the family we noticed now that the problem was increased in scope because not only is there a sick person but somebody who is healthy is now spending all their time dealing with a sick person and so that family is being further dragged into trouble because they are unable to earn and sustain themselves it's known that if you get cancer and you're starting from a rural location if you get cancer your family will pretty much drop below the poverty line and if you look at the statistics, it will probably take a generation before you will come back above the poverty line. Kids will have to struggle to earn better and come back above the poverty line. Okay, that is the scope of this as a impact. So, do not simply think of this as a healthcare problem. There is a bigger economics problem. There is a bigger quality of life problem. Okay. When somebody comes to Parel, now inside the hospital, and that's the best hospital in the country. The best experts. Okay, the most highly trained experts. It's ironic. The reason they're highly trained is because they're seeing such a patient load. There are doctors who come in from Harvard, King's College London, to learn at Tata Memorial, because in a month you will see the kinds of cases and the numbers of cases which you will spend a year, a few years, trying to deal with in the UK or in the US. So, the kind of training you will get is unlike anywhere in the world. The best doctors are out here. It is the same with cardiac surgeries and so on. The best doctors are now in India. Simply because we are so super skilled because of the patient loads. It is a sad fact, but notice the irony. We are developing expertise. But who deals with that woman who has now come into Tata Memorial Parade? Is it one doctor who will see you? You have a major problem already, otherwise you would not have come here. So, there is an aspect of surgery. What are the ways to deal with this? Of course, there is diagnostics. You have to do all kinds of diagnostics, MRI, this, that, whatever. So, all the service departments, all the blood tests, all of that, fine. But in terms of experts who have to deal with the problem, who is going to now deal with the problem? You need a surgeon. You need a radiation oncologist, a guy who aims radiation and kills tissue. And that is not a tricky job. You have to know precisely where the tumor is and figure out how to aim the radiation and the control the dosages. That's a very critical job because if you hit anything else, you will convert normal tissue into cancerous tissue. Right? So, planning these multiple doses is a major engineering challenge, by the way, it turns out. How to aim radiation? How to aim radiation? I've got oral cancer. I can't aim radiation just blindly at my face. Why? Because my retina will get damaged by radiation. So, you have to mask it, you have to shield. So, you have to aim radiation in some particular angle that is shielded. You have to use a lead shield and then aim it here and so on. So, it is in other words, it is not a trivial job. It takes expertise. So, you can either cut it out as a surgeon, you can aim radiation or else what? Drugs, chemotherapy, there also it is not like one dose of antibiotics like you take, you have to change the dose over time. And chemotherapy has multiple side effects, you have to deal with the side effects. Inside trying to solve the primary problem, you are going to create secondary problems and you have to deal with all of them. Right? So, at this point, they at TMH they no longer call them departments, they call them disease management groups. So, you need a group of people who are sitting around a table 
trying to figure out how to deal with one patient. Surgeons, oncologists, radiation oncologists, chemotherapy, anesthesia, pathologists, because the pathologist will finally stare at your tissue samples, biopsy samples under a microscope and say, okay, I think this is cancer or somebody saying, I don't think this is cancer. It takes, in fact, it's a pathologist's opinion which guides everybody else, which confirms that it's cancer or not cancer. So all of these people have to sit and debate, it's like a research problem. They sit and debate because it's life and death for that patient at this point. Okay. My point is, the best experts in the country, so many of them, sit and spend so much time to deal with one case. And how many cases? It's a multiple of this, remember, these are deaths. So there's no bandwidth. We don't have the experts, we don't have the doctors, we don't have the hospitals. So if you look around, the calculation is there are 200 hospitals, cancer hospitals in the country. One, what is our population? 1.3 we have crossed. In fact, as I said, we shortly going to be the largest country population wise in the world. About to overtake China. For a population that size, we are saying there are 200 hospitals where there is expertise. Right? So, how does a population get guaranteed access to these experts? That is the scale of the problem. And at that point, your costs are high. Of course, at TMH, they are subsidized. There are NGOs who come and cover your costs and all that. But that is TMH. If you go to a private hospital, you are dead. You are going to pay huge amounts, right. There are people who come from the northeast all the way to TMH or go to Ames in Delhi or go to CMC in Vellore because that is the only way you will get relatively low cost care and high quality care. Your gamble is that yes, it is a terrible effort to go from let us say Assam all the way to Vellore, but hopefully your problem will be correctly diagnosed, dealt with then you can go back and resume your life. That is a gamble. And that you are saying is better than going to some local hospital, some local doctor getting treatment locally, even if that is more practically convenient for the family, right. So the need statement, I gave you the background to the whole thing. What do we need to do? What needs to be solved? From a practical perspective. I have gone and observed this problem at TMH, I have understood this problem, I have understood what the doctors are attempting to do. I am very sympathetic to the fact that and you have seen this in government hospitals. At the end of the day, there are many sincere doctors trying to make a difference to the patients, giving them low quality, I mean high quality, low cost care and that is what the, the TMH guys are doing. They are like, they, they are not private doctors, they are not being paid crazy amounts. detection at an early stage. How do you know it is detection at an early stage which makes a difference? What is a healthcare system? Where would you, where would you innovate in this, right? Now, the reality is for most of us when we think healthcare, what do you think of healthcare? You have got a problem, you have got a medical problem, what will you do? Where do you go? Where do you go? You have a family doctor or you go to the hospital, what happens? I want to know from your personal experiences. You go to a hospital? Clinic, a regular hospital, a proper hospital, what happens? Depends on the scale of the problem. Yeah, but think think about yourself. Don't don't, don't generalize. I mean, at this point, start start reacting to it from your own personal experiences. Family doctor, for what? A cold, a flu, a fever, that sort of thing. Something more serious than that, slightly more serious than that, then what happens? Okay. The reality is for the majority in the country, the first access to healthcare is the emergency room of a hospital. So, when I say hospital, when I say hospital, I mean intervention. Some, somebody is going to intervene and do something for you. 
when we think of therefore hospitals when you think of healthcare it's hospitals how do i improve healthcare in a particular city build more hospitals that's the way the government thinks okay how does a doctor scale his or her ability to offer healthcare stop being a tiny clinic become a proper hospital few years back when my dad was with me and he was not well we actually used to have a doctor outside the it main gate who agreed to come into the campus and see my dad at home of course i had to pay more for that as a service one fine day he said i'm not doing it anymore why he finally realized that if he just sat at at a desk in his clinic and made people come to him he would make more revenue than whatever i was paying him to come in and then he realized if he set up his own diagnostic lab right next to him he can get his patients immediately make them do some tests make money force them to come back again another follow up appointment right so this guy and i'm watching this guy this guy started as a fresh graduate who was willing to come on to campus and deal with people at home he now has a proper hospital building multi story building near our middle gate and again nothing wrong with what he did that was the quickest way for him to generate revenue but you see that his final convergence of thought is that the best way to offer healthcare to a bunch of people is to put up the hospital and let people come so everybody's idea of healthcare is this when tata memorial asked us to do something in cancer the question was how do we make cancer care at tata memorial more efficient how do i make them more efficient what does that mean how can i make them see more patients in a given day so this is like assembly line stuff how do i convert it into an assembly line i can use a lot of the assembly line principles and and bring it into play here from mechanical engineering from automotive engineering you see that but what is a true healthcare system what is assess- what i mean by assessment if i were to ask government officials the monsoon has started where in mumbai do you expect to see cases of dengue and malaria the municipality has no answer despite years of collecting these reports and iit bombay was a hot spot for dengue the reality is there is no data on what we expect to see why is the data useful supposing i had the data supposing i could assess where malaria is likely to happen what can i what can a municipality do about it you can push resources into it you can do more fumigation there you can push more public health you know officials in there and try to do something about it and prevent the problem from happening rather than react to it afterwards but do you see this do we know where malaria is happening in the country okay there is already information that there are strains of mosquitoes coming in in the north northeast which are starting to move further and further inland into the mainland which are resistant to all known drugs you got versions of the malaria parasite which are resistant to drugs which need much higher dosages of drugs and by the way those higher dosages of drugs will damage your liver if you take these doses too many times we know this from a few published research papers does the government know this does the government know the progress of this no assessment if you knew where the problems were you could deal with it do we know where ebola is at guess what the west has spent a huge amount of money trying to figure out where ebola is happening in africa because you want to contain it there you don't want it to spread you don't want it to come into the us for sure so they are investing money in assessment trying to figure out where the hot spots are to give 
at least one state government in India some credit, the Kerala government has figured out where that Nipah virus outbreak is happening, what the origins are and they have confined it. It is happening, it is not dealt with, it is confined. If they did not control it, there would be a huge disaster. Assessment. When KM hospital in Mumbai decided to figure out what to do with Ebola, when they wanted to have a brainstorming event, this is another weird anecdote. They held the meeting in the busiest part of the hospital and when I went to this meeting, I crossed 100 people who coughed on me, sneezed on me before I got to the meeting room. KM hospital is a very dangerous place to be. If you knew where the problems were, you could deal with it potentially. Do we know where tuber TB is happening? We got drug resistant TB, totally drug resistant TB, which is horrible stuff. Do we know where the hot spots are? Okay. Any relatively rich country actually spends a lot of money just monitoring what is going on and they have a healthcare system where doctors report back and so on and this ultimately a map a GIS system where you keep track of where the outbreaks are or different things. So, finally, why? Finally, so that as a government you can push your money and your resources and your people to deal with the problem and if you knew things in advance and you did some projections and these are now mathematical problems, this is the current state of the, of, of the disease spread, this is how it will escalate and spread both in terms of time and in terms of geography, you could plan your resources, it is no big deal. These are straightforward engineering problems, computational problems. So, that does not happen. Prevention is the next thing, vaccination. Of course, we do have a decent vaccination campaign in India. Polio has worked reasonably well. Why did it work well? Because we actually recruited people to do the door to door stuff. That was the level of investment which had to happen. Smallpox. So, it can be done. The same thing has not worked in Africa. Why? Because they do not have that level of recruitment so that people are going door to door trying to deal with stuff. Prevention. Diagnosis. Early diagnosis, when you say diagnosis, not diagnosis after you have the disease. Early diagnosis of what is going on, conditions. Okay. Of course, the hospitals themselves and intervention. But notice also that there is absolutely no thought paid to the remaining things, recovery, rehabilitation. A hospital, the moment they realize that the surgery is done and that you are on the way to recovery, they will make you stand up, they will make you move and they want to throw you out. Why do they want to throw you out? The next patient, they want to make more money on the surgeries. But what does it mean? Are you ready to go home? Are you recovered? No. So, now notice that this places a burden on your relatives and your family to get you fully back onto your feet. In the west for example, if you look at Scandinavia, you look at Sweden and Finland and Norway, relatives are not allowed to stay in hospitals. In fact, when there is even the delivery of a child, the father sent home, do not even interfere here, let the medical team deal with childbirth. You visit once a, day, once a day, bring your flowers or whatever, that is it. Not allowed to be anywhere near. So, there is a competent team of people who take care of the problem, right. So, recovery, rehabilitation. Think of anybody who has had a relative of yours who has had a stroke, who has tried to recover. What does it take for them to exercise? What does it take for them to get the physiotherapy that they need? What does it take for them to get the mental? counseling, the psychology support that they need. Okay. And there is ultimately a level of administration which professionally should be running all of this, which is not there. So, do you realize that when you talk of healthcare in India, we are talking about this and the reason I bring that up is when you talk of innovation, chances are that therefore, we are talking about innovating at an intervention level. So, when all these doctors asked me for solutions, they were asking me for solutions which would change the way they behaved in the hospitals. 
Could I make them more efficient in a hospital? Instead of spending five minutes on a diagnosis, could they now bring it down to three minutes? That sort of stuff. Instead of one type of material in a device like a stent, can I come up with a cheaper stent? They were asking for things of that nature. But this assumes that you already have a disease and you are already there. Right? Do you see that? So, the business model for healthcare innovation is do stuff in a hospital. Right? So, cervical cancer, deal with it in a hospital. Before we get back to cervical cancer, what, what are your levels, what, what, what's going on in terms of innovation? So, if you look at diagnostics, you can come up with gadgets. These days, we are talking about you know, wearable devices which monitor your vital signs and tell you stuff like a Fitbit, but doing more stuff than a Fitbit. But at the other extreme, I can just analyze your DNA and tell you what mutations you have and which diseases you are likely to get. And if you are getting a particular type of cancer, whether drug X is likely to work on you or drug Y based on your DNA, based on your genetic history. That level of diagnostics knowledge we have and the innovations are there. What else? Okay, you can innovate on products or processes and ultimately you can see whether you can get less skilled people to do it. If you look at dialysis care, what's starting to boom in Mumbai is people who are fed up with trying to travel to a clinic to get their dialysis session. The dialysis you typically will need to go for a 4 hour, 5 hour session once, maybe twice a week. And if you have to travel all the way to a hospital to get your dialysis done, that's tedious. And you cannot go on your own because you are obviously sick. So, yes, again somebody has to take you. And for people who are reasonably well off, they ask the question, why can't I get dialysis done at home? Can I rent a dialysis machine and can a paramedic come, hook me up to the machine, get the process done and disconnect and go off? I will pay because I want that convenience, right? That kind of business model is starting to happen, home care. Okay, so it's not the nephrologist who's treating you; it's a paramedic who's treating you. Okay, in terms of therapies, many things are happening. For example, again, gadgets which are being implanted. Okay, gene therapy, cancers which, if you've got mutations, can I reverse the mutation? Can I put in the right type of cell and reverse the effects of the mutant cells? So that sort of stuff is starting to happen. We're talking about 3D printers for plastic, they are starting to Google, Google of all companies, Google has invested in healthcare, Google is starting to print organs, basically the same technology, a cell solution, but it is layering them and printing an entire organ. So, you can see that in theory down the road you will apply for replacement spare parts, you think your kidneys will fail, you can right into Google and get a replacement kidney. The biggest innovation to happen in India is in the notion of a health city or start with boutique hospitals and then escalate to health cities. You have heard of Narayana Hridala and Dr. Devi Shetty, why is he famous? He yeah. is done many, many people have done open heart surgery, no, no. The volume. How come he is able to handle large volumes? I saw him in the late 1990s when he was starting and his brain wave was to set up an assembly line. Okay. This thing was I do not want to be a general purpose hospital, I am just one specialty, I am going to look at one specialty, open heart surgery. So, his expertise is in ultimately cutting apart trees, stitching them together. How do you convert that into an assembly line? How do you make it a continuous process almost? Patients must come in. Then what? Different people do different jobs. Somebody will open you up. Why should Devi Shetty spend his time opening you up? Somebody else does it. What should Devi Shetty do? The one task of stitching up blood vessels, the critical part because you trust his hands. Assembly line. And after he's done that, then what? Somebody else will put you back together again, he'll close you up and stitch you up and so his way of functioning was literally he's between two beds. Patient one here, patient two there, patient two is waiting, patient one he stitches them up, turns, removes gloves, gets a new pair 
uh, things put on was on due to this patient. If he has a 5 minute break in between, he does an OPD consultant, there is patients waiting to get opinions. He is using his time and he is not seeing any random patient, he is seeing those patients which his junior doctors are incapable of correctly diagnosing. Model of this, the expert is doing stuff which requires expertise, everybody else has been trained to take on other tasks including nurses. We are not expecting doctors to do everything. We have an attitude, the doctor you go to, the family doctor, he will do everything to you. And we also expect that the expert will strap on the BP. Why is the doctor taking your BP measurement? At TMH, you go into TMH, you got cancer, who is collecting your BP measurement? The surgeon. Why is the surgeon collecting your BP measurement? Okay. So, this guy's brainwave is how to come up with an assembly line way of thinking. That's engineers would have immediately spotted the manufacturing advantages of that. He just brought that thought process into medicine. Now, something else happens the moment you super specialize in one thing alone. He is now running on the bypasses and angiograms. He is inserting stents. What happens? If he is now going to go into doing 100 of these per day instead of 5 per day, a multi-specialty hospital may be dealing with a few heart attacks and plenty of other diseases. He is dealing only with heart attacks and with bypasses. He is using 100 strengths a day instead of 5. What happens? Economics of scale. When he is negotiating with vendors to buy his strengths, he is not buying them at a much lower price because he is offering volumes of business. And he is therefore able to pass on these cost benefits to the consumer. So, the cost of a surgery drops. Okay. So, that is the insight and if you start looking around, yes, you will start seeing in Mumbai it is for sure started, maybe in other towns as well, you are starting to see boutique hospitals, they are called boutique hospitals because they deal with one condition alone. You want childbirth, you want to give birth to a child, this is specialized hospital just for that, they will do nothing else, just childbirth. Right. So, if you think about it, this is why government hospitals struggle because they are trying to be multi-specialty everything and they are doing everything less efficiently. So, notice that his, it is not a brand new idea, it is a standard manufacturing thing. If you looked at cars, this is a 100 year old idea of how to have an assembly line for manufacture of cars that has been brought into the medical world finally and there is economies of scale. Every single component from the plastic syringes, the needles, the surgical implements, everything is negotiated and the pricing lowered because it is bought in bulk, because there is such scales of operation. It all matters, every small thing matters, and you track down, drive down costing. He did this at one place in Bangalore, idea worked, he set up many more hospitals. How do you scale beyond that? Where is his latest hospital? He went to the West Indies. Why the West Indies? For all those Americans who need bypasses, who cannot afford it in the US, go on a holiday to the Caribbean. As part of your holiday, get your bypass done, continue your holiday, go back. It is far cheaper than getting it done, the whole thing done in the US. So, luxury health cities, there is one coming up in Dubai. In India, Bangalore is trying to be a health city. You have got medical colleges there and they are also on the Gulf, they are facing the Gulf. So, they are offering their services now. Health cities, that is our concept of innovation. Is there really a technology innovation which has happened here? No, it is just a business model which has happened here. Nothing wrong with that. That is still changing the way people behave and it is definitely impacting the cost of healthcare for people, right. So, to come back to cervical cancer, at this point I have given you now all the background you need. What is the healthcare system like? What is the disease like? So, whose problem is this? Whose need is this? Who should be working on this? Who should have been thinking of this? Ideally, who starts thinking of this? 
the government who is most impacted by having 100,000 people die and a million people fall sick, the government. What is the problem with healthcare as a subject in the country? Is it a, cent is this a central topic? Is it a state topic? Both. Both states ultimately control this. Now, if you think about it, which states have good healthcare? Tamil Nadu. Why? Okay, which state has poor healthcare? Just give me one example. Jharkhand. Okay, so why is Tamil Nadu good? Why is Jharkhand bad? If a state has to spend money on services for its population, <coughs> what would it spend money on? Food, education. education, energy, water, healthcare. But there is a priority there. For example, if you don't have food and water, you are not thinking about healthcare personally, right? So, what are Jharkhand's priorities? Not healthcare. Because there are more urgent problems than healthcare. Whereas Tamil Nadu has more or less solved many of the other issues, which is why they can start spending money on healthcare, which is why it shows as if they have got better healthcare. But it comes down to a state's ability to spend, and everyone has a pecking order. In Maharashtra, some several years back now, when a bunch of NGOs came to IIT Bombay and the intent was to ask them to identify problem statements where engineers could help. 40 NGOs came, not one asked for healthcare. Everyone wanted some energy solutions, some solar, some wind, they wanted water of course, because there is no water in the state. Nobody asked for healthcare. It is not that healthcare is not important, it is important, but that priorities, people have priorities and that is absolutely right. In fact, you see an actual even more serious issue now, which is the government is clearly not offering services for whatever reason. Second, even the NGOs are prioritizing what they would spend time on. So, who is then dealing with healthcare? Nobody. Once the other problems are dealt with, maybe the NGOs will come around to healthcare, maybe the philanthropic foundations which are donating money will come around to healthcare. But till the other problems are not solved, this won't get solved. So, whose responsibility is it? That is the point. Who thinks of solutions? So, one of the things we have learned is that these kinds of things need to be thought of in academic settings. Okay, why? Because unless somebody carries out an experiment and says, here is how technology might change how something is happening in healthcare, nobody else is bothered for the moment. And nobody else is bothered because they have got other reasons to, they have got other things to think about. So, you have got to make it something that they have to think about. Right? How do you make make it something to think about. You have to ultimately run some kind of experiment where you create a technology and you deploy it and you show how something improves because of it. Of course, you do not have money to do it on a large scale. So, you will only do it in a small scale. Maybe you will do it in one village. But the moment you say my solution makes a difference in one village, you can at least at this point you can take it to somebody and say, I think this might have a larger impact if you were to adopt this solution. But you have to have that evidence. Okay. Who will do this? Obviously, no big company will come in and do this. There is no profit to be made by going into a village and solving such problems. The NGOs could have done it, but they are busy with something else. The government sector is not in, in, too disorganized to do this. So, if you think about it, the, the set of us who have reasonably steady jobs as academics may have access to motivated students may have access to a limited amount of money, which for example, you guys will have access to tech funding. You deploy it and try to solve a local problem and show how technology makes a difference locally. And then you start making steadily the argument that this solution really deserves to be scaled. And then you take it to the right people who will scale it, which finally will be some politician if the government controls this or it could be some donor if the philanthropy as a foundation controls funding.
right. But the foundation for example, you go up to Tata Trust and say I want to do something here, they will say we do not care, we are worried about energy and water and so on, everyone has priorities. So, for you to ultimately demonstrate something and then do this. So, the responsibility of solving that final societal problem at a small scale has to be somebody's, otherwise the whole thing does not get kick start. And what I am trying to point out is it is possible to get it done. So, to come to the Gynecam story finally, the real need and notice that I am drafting this. The need was not early stage detection of cervical cancer, that was wrong, you said this earlier, early stage detection. Why is that wrong? What else is extra in this? Treatment. I have no business walking into a village screening a woman and saying you have cervical cancer and then turning around and saying bye. I have no business doing that. It is ethically wrong because I have worsened their life, because I have ruined their peace of mind. So, I am doing this if I know how to fix it. Do you see that? So, if you know how to fix a problem, then go in there and diagnose it. Then yes, building a diagnostic makes a difference. In this case, the treatment involves, of course, if it is a late stage disease, as I told you, surgery, radiation is that. But early stage, when I have a small sore, it turns out if there is a viral infection there, I can heat kill it. You take a small device, kind of like a soldering iron, of course, not that hot, 100 degrees centigrade, you touch it to tissue, it will kill the tissue next to it. And in the process, it will also kill the virus, which is causing that infection. So, effectively, I kill a small sore, that is a better outcome than leaving it there. Right? Now, if I did not have this tool to, to essentially disinfect and kill that sore, then I have no business going in there and doing any diagnosis. In fact, the only people who become rich here are diagnostics companies, who become rich because of all the large scale screening that is happening. So, you offer a solution which has to be holistic. So, the end solution people want is an identification of a clinical problem and a cure for it immediately. Okay. Now, where must the solution happen? What is the rest of this? Why this? Will early stage screening ever happen at Tata Memorial? Never. Because only people coming there are with full blown disease. It is too late. So, therefore, if I have to do early stage detection, now I am forced into figuring out a way into somebody's home where people are not, as I said, will you will you walk in into a hospital and get screened for server for cancer? I asked you that question earlier. You laughed. So, if you are not going to get screened and yet it is important to screen, how do I do this? I have to find a way to get into your home and screen you there, right. So, that is the thought process in this. And the same thing if you paint with iodine, there will be a patch which looks differently colored and why is that useful? Rather than trying to stare at it with your eye, your, your naked eye cannot make out an infected portion and an uninfected portion. But if I have colorized it, it is like I used a highlighter. Now, I can see a patch of tissue which potentially is something is going on there, may have cervical cancer, may not have cervical cancer, but something is going on there. Okay. So, what was being done was nurses were being trained to execute this. So, all these nurses and midwives and ASHA workers we talked about. So, Tata Memorial was starting to train nurses to go out there and connect with women and look at the cervix and see whether you can diagnose this. Now, what are the problems with that? If I show you something and say do you see a patch? Your definition of a patch and my definition of a patch may be different, right. So, it is very subjective, right. Now, this can allow for many cases to go undetected if it comes down to a nurse's ability to discriminate patches. So, how do you make this more rigorous? You said build a gadget which takes photos, you control the lighting, you take photos, and then I can take a photo of the cervix, I need to spot a lesion, I need to identify whether this is a lesion or not, what can I do? How do I automate, automate this or how do I arrive at a diagnosis? So, at this point a nurse is taking an image, how do I arrive at a diagnosis? Send to an expert, who is an expert? A gynecologist somewhere, right? Somebody who can interpret what they are seeing 
just like that pathologist in an urban setting is the one you trust, you have got to trust a gynec who knows what you are It turns out there was a controlled experiment done a while back. You show the same image to three or four gynecs, they will disagree. It is not as straightforward as you think it is because again the level of human training differs, right. So, it is not so clear cut that you get diagnosis. The other thing that happens is there are no records, scraps of paper. And medical records do not move, you know that no? in the country you go from one place to another, you go from one doctor to another, he will force you to do all kinds of diagnostics all over again, he does not trust your medical records. So, it turns out there were many gaps. So, go back to my need specification, what were the gaps? What is the need? What are the gaps? So, there are many things. We need an affordable yet accurate test. Just because I am trying to come up with a cheap test does not mean my test should start making mistakes. There is no compromise on the quality of what you are coming up with as a diagnostic service to somebody, ok. Should be able to do it, transfer the data, I should be able to train people, should be teamed up with some awareness thing or well, you know, it is think of the whole process. It is weird if somebody suddenly walks up to your home and comes in and says I want to test you for a cancer. So, you cannot barge in and just do it, you have to train people, you have to bring them into a screening program. Maybe you offer to test their BP levels to check whether they have diabetes. Once they are comfortable with you, then you say oral cancer, then cervical cancer. As it is women, rural, not coming up for any screening, not coming up for any diagnosis, right. So, there is a lot of inhibition there. What are the products already out there? And it turns out there are many prototype solutions already out there on the market, which allows the visualization of the cervix. And there are even portable solutions which have started coming out. This one is no longer on the market. This one is, and you can see what it is. It's basically a high-end smartphone with additional optics on it, trying to capture an image. So clearly, you need to make something which costs far less than 3 lakhs, cheaper the better. Still a question as to how, who is going to pay for this and ultimately give it to a nurse. Note, notice that no nurse will buy stuff on her own. So, somebody has to buy it and just like that rotary club wheelchair thing, somebody has to buy and give it to that nurse. Who is that somebody? Ok. These are the features we had. By the way, this is what it looks like when you actually look at a cervix and you see a whitish stretch over here and, and well, over here as well. And there is a clear wound here, which shows it. So, on the right side it is iodine, on the left side it is vinegar. This part is not actually challenging. This is so big a wound that even visually you would have, anybody, the nurse would have spotted visually. You did not need a, you did not need a gadget to tell you this. So, what is the real challenge? The real challenge is how do you detect this when it is a tiny wound? early detection, not late detection, ok. What happens next? So, this is at this point a bunch of engineers playing around with the prototype. You will realize it is nothing more than just a digital camera. The reason it is in a particular casing is because we are isolating the camera. We are expecting that later on the casing can be wiped down and sterilized. You might put some alcohol or something on it and make sure it is sterile. All of this is for the moment just 3D printed. You see the casing is 3D printed. That is not the final material. We are not interested in figuring out the final material till we understand whether the design works, right. So, we are not in a rush to create the final market ready version. We are asking which features are critical, which are not. You also realize that this is not touch screen, right. Why? Because we are trying to bring down the costing to the extent we could. And it was easier to buy these industrial modules with buttons there, which are there on your safety cameras and so on, right. So, an initial set of prototypes must look like this in the sense they are all, all crude raw components just put together for the sake of figuring out whether the end process is going to happen or not. The objective is not to build a great gadget, the objective is to diagnose cervical cancer for which you need high quality images and whatever it takes to get the images. 
once you know it's working then you'll spend all your time asking how do i make that more glamorous how do i make it more marketable how do i make it more robust in that village will be dropped down many things will happen to it your chance of repairing it are minimal how do i fix all of that but that's after i first prove that it solves the intended problem right so that implies then to figure out if it solves the intended problem in our case it became important to make multiple copies of this and just give it away now that's the challenge who's going to give you money to make multiple copies of this let's say that the, each of this costs us 20000 in terms of parts so you do the math so many spots there you can't send one unit because it might break down so send them two so you need to make 20 copies 40 copies and give them away at 20000 per piece that's a lot of money that immediately forced us into figuring out how to get donations so notice that the scope of the problem as a research team changes first what was the need to solve it took us by the way i should have told you this earlier took us two years to realize that the solution we needed to build was an imaging solution and not the pap smear not an hpv kit we tried to build both of the, the other two things and then realized that the hpv kit will always be too expensive even if we come up with a cheaper kit yeah yeah, so here finally if you think about it, yes there is a hardware cost, but then the cost of acquiring an image is negligible. And if diagnosis depends on images alone, that is cheaper than diagnosis depending on some chip with some reagents on it, which is HPV kit. Or if it depends on a pathologist reviewing a piece of tissue, because then I have to pay the pathologist to look at the slide. And the pathologist might charge me 2000 bucks for the whole service. Right, so if I am expecting a nurse to do this, at minimal, what is the calculation, what is it? It should be a minimal cost per patient screened, not in terms of hardware, but in terms of running costs. So I assume that somebody will, just like your wheelchair, somebody will give you the hardware. If the plan is to screen, I should spend the least amount of money per woman screened. Of course, I will need manpower, I have to pay for each ASHA worker, I have to pay a fee for going in connecting with the woman in the household and then executing the screen. I have to pay the ASHA worker, I have to worry about the cost of the technology per use. But per use this is, now if you do the calculation, the cheapest cost compared to the pap smear, compared to the HPV test. That is the thought process. So we actually worked on all three, it took us two years to realize we are working on the wrong solutions and we came around to this. Then when you, we made the copies, we gave them away, you give them to high end hospitals, you give them to public health centers and villages, you want to understand how is this technology going to be used by different people, by different levels of skill. There is no point giving this hardware to Tata Memorial, because Tata Memorial can afford to buy a 3 lakh device, it can afford to buy a 10 lakh device and use it. They are not the ones who will go into a village and screen. So asking their opinion on technology is pointless. Right? So, no, so notice that I have used them to identify the problem. I didn't use them to identify the solution because they have asked me to build a solution for Tata Memorial which is the wrong thing to build. Okay. In fact, when we showed it to some of the fancier places, the first reaction is this looks very crude. Of course, it is crude, it is 3D printed and so on. And then you realize the mindset is they are all doctors, surgeons who are walking around with iPhones and they want something which looks glamorous. They are willing to pay. 3 lakhs if it is compact put in a pocket. So, there is a market, you can build a product at that price point, that is because the directors want to do it. The problem is how many patients will a director of hospital see? Negligible, right. So, who is this therefore being built for? Nurses. What is the price point nurses can afford? Well, they will not pay for it themselves. Some doctor must finally prescribe it and hand off to the nurse. So, what is the price point? 20,000 maybe? less than that is better, right. What can you, how many features can you cram in at 20,000? iPhone, Geophone, I showed you my two phones. What is the price differential between the two phones? Same challenge, okay. So we made these copies, we understood dynamics here about mindsets of people as to use it. Now here is the interesting thing, how is cervical cancer being screened in the country as of now? Pap smear, HPV test. 
not this and definitely not in the hands of a nurse. Has a nurse been allowed to screen for cervical cancer in the country so far? No. You can immediately see a problem which is all the experts will scream that how can a nurse do what a doctor is doing? Okay, if you walk around in hospitals you realize that actually there are very competent nurses but they are not allowed to do many tasks because the doctors prevent them from doing it because the doctors do not want to lose control. So, therefore, if, you are, if I am arguing that technology in the hands of a nurse will change something, then that experiment I told you, I have to do an experiment now. What is that exp experiment? My experiment is, if I take a nurse in a village and give her the device and she collects an image, she is not authorized to diagnose based on the image herself. She is not a doctor, she is just a nurse. She just captures the data. She then relays this data to a gynec sitting remotely. Who is the expert? The expert will write the report. What should I check to see? I should check to see whether the diagnosis that comes through this process is the same as a diagnosis if a gynec happened to be on site live. If the diagnosis is the same, positive, positive, negative, negative, if the diagnosis is the same, what does it mean? It means that this process is equivalent to this process. This is the way it is being done now. I end up proving that theoretically this is equivalent in terms of accuracy compared to the existing way of doing things. And what is the outcome of doing it this way? What finally is the technology achieving in doing it this way? I have shifted a task which was being carried out by an expert to something being carried out by a nurse. I have shifted a task and I have done this by giving her a technology, a piece of technology to do it. Do you see the and end outcome is not simply a gadget, the end outcome is a task shift away from expert to a nurse. Okay. What did, what did uh, Devi Shetty do? He task shifted many of his things away onto his support staff. Okay. So, it is the same thing, it is the same concept ultimately. Now, this requires a clinical trial. Because I want it to be done under controlled conditions. What does it mean? Bring in, you have to recruit patients into a study. That patient has to be seen by this gynec, you have to offer. You can't simply bring in people and say, I will get you a remote diagnosis, that will not work. So, you give them the local gynec, but there is also a nurse who is without, without paying attention to who is not aware of this diagnosis, a nurse who is just collecting data, the images and is feeding them to the remote gynec. So, I have to set up that whole process. So, in other words, a single patient is being seen by a nurse and the local expert. So, I set up that process as a study. I have to calculate how many people do I need to see and it turns out our calculations were 600 patients had to be seen before you got enough statistical data to say that your results are equivalent. And by the way, when I find that somebody has a positive case, what, what happens next? I have to treat them. Okay. Now, this as an engineer I had never even thought about. If I do a study like this, the cost of treatment has become my responsibility because they are all doing this as part of my research experiment. Okay. And did I have money put aside for this? For actually treating people? No. So, now again you go out, beg for money, donors, I will come to that at the end. Okay. Go to donors, get donations and you run this as an experiment. It took us 25 lakhs to deal with screening 600 women. Okay. Next, does your nurse know what cervical cancer is? Actually, most people do not even know what cancer is. Leverage. We will own cervical cancer. So, what it took was for us to now start creating a whole set of video tutorials explaining what cancer was about, what cervical cancer was. And while you are at it, creating an entire syllabus of sorts of how you are going to, you can see this, how are you going to go and set up your table and set up your instruments and set up whatever it is. Because you want that, you can't, you can't let people arbitrarily, you can't nurses arbitrarily do stuff. It has to be a rigorous process. It has to be a high quality process. So, you have to go through a training process. And each step in this has to be listed, identified. And unless you control all of this, the way your technology is being utilized is probably not inaccurate. And if your technology is not being handled right, your problem is your out result outcomes, your experiment results may be wrong. 
So, you have to give yourself the best chance of figuring out what impact the technology is doing, which means you have to train people and make sure people's learning levels are not impacting the scope of your study. So, we trained and now, now here is the problem, most of these women are illiterate. So, it is not like I am giving you a lecture in English, I cannot go into like Sholapur and then talk to these nurses in English, Marathi. Marathi it turns out is not one language, every 100 kilometers the dialects change, the terminologies use change. So, creating this training material itself turned out to be a major challenge, customizing it and validating that it is something people locally will understand itself became a challenge. So, you have to create tutorials, many tutorials, how do you screen? random check, how do you keep records and so on. All of these were deliberately done with some simple artwork because finally we realized that at best these nurses would have phones and you cannot give them fancy videos and so on and ask them to watch this stuff. So, it has to be a small form factor set of videos on which you create these things. Remember our directors wanted a fancy device touch screen, anybody who has used an iPhone who has taken photos on an iPhone will crib because you have to press buttons on this. We are so used to just touching the screen and requiring a photo and our, uh, our hospital directors wanted fancy stuff. Now, to come to the business model, if somebody wants a fancy device, do you make it or do you not make it? If I create a product for the director of hospital, it is likely going to have negligible impact. Because the guy is wearing it, uh, carrying it around more as a toy than as an actual medical device, right. So, what is the way to deal with this? Unless I satisfy the director, he is not going to place an order of devices for his nurse. Do you see that dynamic? Because the nurse is not in control of the purchase process, just like the handicapped person was not in control of the wheelchair purchase. The nurse is not in control of the purchase process. This will go through some tendering thing and you know the usual story. So, some either some bureaucrat or some director, hospital director will be in control of this. And the hospital director wants a toy. What, do you, what is the solution? Give him a toy, get him out of the way, build a toy, give it to him, get him out of the way. So, the same technology which is in that, he put into a smarter version. He wanted touch screen, we gave him touch screen. So, your business model is sell a high end version simply because you want to market a low cost version. Do you see the trickery in this? The real product is a low cost version. At the end of the day, the feature set will be the same. I do not think we have the, we may have the casing for this, not the actual product. Okay. I think we have the casing which also, but it's just as we put a smartphone in this thing and said it's the same. If you look at the feature set, it's absolutely the same. Yeah. So we, we're just conning people. Yeah. Because it doesn't give you that level of magnification that you need. So that's why the additional optics. If you look at, okay, there's additional optics loaded in the front. That is one thing, ok. The communication setup was the second thing, ok. The need to mount this on a tripod, so the nurse's hands are free to deal with the patient was the other thing. So, it needed a case of some kind. So, can I put a phone? The answer is yes, ok. As it turns out, and this is again a sad issue, when I built something like this, it is much cheaper for us to in India buy the phone then to separately buy the optics inside the phone. If I write to, this is a Motorola phone or we will later on switch to Samsung. We spoke to Samsung and said give us the optics in your phone and obviously they are buying the optics from some vendor and they are assembling it in their phones. But their answer is if you are willing to buy 10,000 copies of the optics fine, but who? We cannot offer 10,000 copies, I want 100, right. So, if you are not going to supply me the parts. And at some point it is cheaper for me to put the whole phone in, even though out of the entire phone all I really need are the optics. Why is the optics great? Obviously, because people want smartphones with good cameras increasingly and they miniaturize the whole optics assembly. 
the old SLR digital cameras, if you look at them, they are no longer, you know, where do you, do you find them on the market much anymore? No. Everyone now does photography with a phone. Right? So, the other thing which happens with the phone and the software on the phone, for example, is it interferes with what you are trying to do. You do, do I need a full Android system, for example? Yeah, I don't want people starting to play games on this. If I had simply given the nurse a phone, in fact, if you had given, think about this, if you had given a nurse in a village a phone, would it remain with the nurse or would somebody else grab it? So, you cannot be giving them a phone. The third reason to be careful about this is the infection angle. Do not let your technology itself be become a root cause of spread of disease in this case. So, even if it is a phone, hide, hide it inside some casing and cut down the features and make sure it cannot be abused. You should only do what you intend to do, ok. okay. So, just a few last points on this. It turns out the best way to manufacture this if you want to make a uh, thousand copies, I want to make thousand copies, where should I go? Again, I am not, uh, let us assume I have money, uh, but I want to make thousand copies of a polished device, where do I go? Industry, which industry? It turns out we do not have that skill for high end finish work for the most part in India. There are some companies doing it, but they are doing it for GE and Philips and so on, the very high end companies work and they are paying, they will charge you a lot. We cannot afford those kinds of. So, ironically, it turns out cheaper to go to Shanghai, do it there, which you have not done because you did not have that kind of money. But point is, we have finally figured out how to do it with a low end, a low cost manufacturer. But it will not be a hype, it will not be like we have made a phone, it will not have that finish. But that is ok, as long as it serves the function, it is ok, ok. How do you market this? Is this a medical device? The moment I say it is a formal medical device, people will say, did you diagnose using this? Then how do you validate that it is a correct diagnosis? I will get trapped into all kinds of certification. You know, buy a glucometer or whatever, these are certified devices. Because remember, based on your blood glucose test, you will decide on how much insulin to take. So, it is critical. So, it needs a certification. So, if treatment depends on those diagnosis, that is tricky. So, we stayed away from saying all that. We simply said this is capturing some data and going to gynec, who is the one who is interpreting the data. And not saying this itself is arriving at a conclusion. We are part of something that the Tata Trusts are doing in the Northeast and the emphasis is primarily on Assam, but we will also be in Bengal. There they are trying to set up three major cancer hospitals and a layer of smaller centers in the districts. They are trying to create a new Tata, cent, uh, Tata, uh, Tata Cancer Hospital in uh, uh, couple of uh, cities in Assam. Silchar is one of them. Kachar Cancer Center is being upgraded into one of them. Now, the catch with this is remember my slide about the healthcare system. What does setting up three more hospitals in Assam do next to nothing? By the way, the land is so difficult to travel around that most people will not even bother to come to the hospital. And again, until it is too late. So, the question therefore is how do you flip this and do early detection? How do you train a bunch of nurses to go out into the villages and screen and prevent things from happening? And if you look at it from an economics argument, there is a limited pot of money to do whatever in cancer care. Do you spend it on hospitals and experts or do you spend it on frontline detection? Bring down the number of people you diagnose. So, let us say there is a thousand people. You cannot afford to do high quality diagnosis for thousand people but maybe I can do low cost screening for 1000 people and if I can bring down the 1000 people to let us say 10 people using my technology, the 10 people I can afford to do high quality diagnosis on them because that, that money spent, fine, uh, you cannot compromise on pap smear and so on, but that money spent is sustainable. So, the challenge is which people deserve the money 
and you have to therefore screen an entire population and figure out which of them are suspect cases where something might be going on. So that is what we are trying to understand in a field trial in the northeast. What is the economics of screening an entire district? So it is not a question about technology anymore. Technology is going to provide a service. That service is useful if it is financially, be financially viable. If I can make the argument that this is the cost of screening a district, maybe governments will wake up and say okay, we will do this. So the Tata trusts are basically arguing that let us take a district, let us screen a population, let us put up the hospitals to cater to the cases which will be found and let us work out the cost of this whole package and that cost we now go from state government to state government and put up cancer centers down the road and you try to get the state governments to start paying for it. But the state government, you go walk up to a state government like Jharkhand, what does Jharkhand know about cancer? Nothing. So they will have no game plan. Somebody has to create the game plan, right? So it is an experiment. You do an experiment in Assam, if it works, you can go do it in other places and you can scale. I talked about treatment, you have got to be able to treat people on site. Now what I did not spend time on was machine learning. By the way, the real solution ideally is we remember if you do not have experts to diagnose and I have taken an image, can I use machine learning to spot the feature, the lesion? The answer is yes. The quick answer is yes, slow, but then slow down. If you gave a nurse a gadget which allows her to automatically diagnose, what would she do? There are dangers here. She is not a doctor, she is illiterate. You gave her a technology which gives her the opportunity to do something more, maybe even make more money on the side by offering a treatment. There are dangers here. So you do not rush, you test this out in a in a rigorous experiment mode. Again, we collect the images, we benchmark and in fact, ideally we are proving that machine learning is more accurate than even a gynecologist, right? But if you jump the gun, this could backfire on you because then people will say that you have actually harmed people by allowing nurses to use this in uncontrolled fashion, okay? So that is that part I talk about here. Do we understand how technology is going to be used in a given place? It is easy for me to sit here and assume that Best case scenario, people will, people's lives will be saved. But what if people use the technology the wrong way? Okay. Why should people work on it? What is an incentive? The pap smear. Right now in Hinduja hospital, there are pathologists who are looking at images of tissue samples which are coming from the West, from US. Patients in the US, biopsies taken there, photos, photos being taken of those biopsy samples. Pathologist is reviewing here because they are more expert and because they are cheaper. These doctors, these pathologists are running in dollars per sample that is being reported on. Why would a doctor who is earning in dollars suddenly look at an image coming from Assam? What is the financial incentive? Who is going to therefore look at all this data when the data comes? Okay. So it will come back to a financial argument of sorts. Funding, finally, we got initially a Tata Center grant, but after that we created a team to just go out and get money. It turns out if you write your need statement properly and go and tell people this is what we are trying to solve, a number of people and this is in hindsight surprising, we thought it is going to be very hard to get money. A number of people came, it should be no surprise in hindsight, we were saying we are doing something about women's health, rural, okay, bottom of the pyramid, all those buzzwords were there in terms of impact. So people were glad to fund us and we thought it was going to be difficult. If you go to DST or DBT and try to write proposals, you will not get this kind of funding. So your funding has to go to the right agency. In this case, these are donors, these are corporates. Have you heard of CSR? So see, these are all CSR donations. And corporates had to give it away for something on social impact and we simply made the case for why they should fund us to create a technology because it will end up ultimately having an impact and the money came. And money came at a scale which the government would have never given us. I know this because I sit on the government committee and I know how painful it is to get those grants and do the follow up on those grants. The team structure which worked on this, what should immediately strike you here is that there is a range of people, the skill sets. It, it is not a case where one person will sit and crack this problem. That is not possible. Okay, you have to what find a way to the training material. We had to not just create the video tutorials, we had to obviously 
So, an engineer going there and trying to figure out how a nurse will appreciate this does not work. I am you know, hopeless at giving a lecture to a nurse. So, you need people who are trained with that level of communication who can spend time and go in there. So, they have a more of a sociology background. So, so I needed people with humanities training to come into my team because otherwise I would never crack this problem. That is the point I am trying to make. So, it starts off with as an engineering problem, but it grows. I, what I have not listed here is I have needed a business manager. So, I need, I need to raise funds. At some point, I need to raise funds. So, in other words, if you think about it, I am behaving like a startup. It is a team which would be like a startup, but it is a startup inside the data center, it is inside a lab and what, where you go with this is, if this were a startup, this would never be profitable. Because if I were to actually incubate this as a startup in a business incubator, the first thing somebody will ask me is, when do you expect to make revenue? When do you expect to make profit and revenue? And the answer is, I might never make profit. And then the question is, therefore, if you are not making profit, we do not want you working on something for villages. Work on the 3 lakh device and make profit by selling it to high end hospitals and all these directors and sell the toy to the directors. In which case, yes, I will be profitable, but I have no impact. Right? So, the argument therefore we have made is that this team needs to sit inside a university setting and try this out because if it jumps outside, investors will push us into trying to create profit and we will lose the original reason for why we are innovating on this in the first place. So, the challenge ultimately is how do you create a club type activity to innovate and get this done inside your university settings. I will leave this, we are desperately out of time, maybe. So, it will come down to motivation. So, we got put pushed into a corner where we asked how will you solve this as a bunch of engineers and we got put as, as IIT Bombay, we got put under pressure to deal with cervical cancer. Well, to deal with cancer we picked cervical cancer and what happens is the set of people who worked on it were highly motivated and that is a game changer. I am not talking myself, I am talking the team members. Once you find a couple of motivated people then, you know. so one of the things to ask is why you are working on this as in is the student working on it to satisfy some project requirement in which case nothing will really happen. But I have been lucky enough to have people who come to me and demand that I give them resources, whether it is money or I add recruit more people into the team. Because at this point, they are not working on my project, I am working on their project. And there is a philosophical difference. They are driving it. On a day-to-day -day basis, they are driving it. I am busy with lecturing, I am busy with other things. I cannot drive this all the time. But there are other people who are driving it. And those people are committed enough that they are asking for resources, which makes the whole job easier. In fact, when you think of donors giving you money, it is like an investor giving you money. And what does an investor base a judgment on how to give you money? They look at, they look at your eyes and say, how committed are you? It does not matter whether you have the technical skills or not. They look at your commitment levels. Okay? And that is where having committed students around you will make a huge difference in getting these things done. And you have to understand what is that impact you wish to make. So, what about We'll stop here, and maybe we can take some of any discussion that we have over lunch. Yeah. Thanks, guys.